church, let's grab our Bibles. We're going to look in Matthew's Gospel this morning. We are on a break from our long series in Revelation. Actually, we've concluded it. We're going to start up Daniel next week. So this morning, this Lord's Day, let's turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 27, and we're going to look at verses 45 through 56. Interestingly, the parallel text that uh, we had preached to us on Good Friday from Luke's Gospel. So this time we're going to be in Matthew. Uh, Let's go ahead and stand up for the reading of the Word of God as we recognize that God's Word is inspired. It is the inerrant, true, authoritative Word of the living God, and so we recognize it for what it is this morning. Again, Matthew chapter 27, verse 45 is our text. Listen now carefully to the Word of God. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, and about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. But others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. Verse 51, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split, And then this will be our focus this morning, verse 52. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Joseph, the mother of the sons of Zebedee. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Amen. You may be seated. Matthew's gospel tells us something that, if true, is absolutely extraordinary. Now, I say, if true, not because I doubt it. I believe everything in this book with all of my heart, and I hope you do too. I believe all of it, everything in here. No doubt for me this morning. But I say, if true, because there are some people, even amongst those that we might consider so-called evangelical Christians, who have some kind of a doubt about the very thing that I just read to you from verses 52 and and verses 53. Now, let's just gather up the context here. This is a passage that might more ordinarily be preached on a Good Friday service. This this, This is the same text, the parallel passage that David preached, in fact, just a couple of days ago from Luke's gospel. It's the death of Jesus. And Matthew here, the gospel writer, he stresses, it would seem to me, that four things happen simultaneously or nearly simultaneously to the exact moments. Matthew ties this nearly exactly to the very moment that Jesus dies. Remember, David stressed the very moment where Jesus expires. He breathes his last and he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Matthew mentions four things that happen nearly simultaneously. Let's just review them really quickly for the sake of context. First, the temple curtain is torn in two from top to bottom, okay? This is that glorious, beautiful, huge curtain, 60 feet tall, 30 feet wide, that separates the holy place from the, from the most holy place in the temple. We could preach an entire sermon and probably should on another occasion about the significance of the tearing of that curtain. That seems to take place precisely when Jesus breathes his last and dies, Moreover, there is an earthquake that seems to take place at the exact same moment that Jesus dies. Did you notice that? Now, given that earthquakes are probably a little bit more common in the Near East than they are here in western Pennsylvania, but, but, but nevertheless, in the Bible, don't forget that earthquakes hold a special prominence. Uh, they usually are attended with some kind of a judgment Uh, uh, events in the scriptures. We might think of like Exodus 19 by way of example, 
right? When God gives the law on Sinai, there's an earthquake. So also in the book of Revelation, when we studied all of that, there was various earthquakes announcing the very judgment of God. So that seems to be significant. Yes, this earthquake that happens. Okay, still the third thing then is that tombs are broken open. Now let me just explain that because that becomes relevant here in just a moment. We're, not, we're talking not only about people that are buried in the ground as ordinarily would be the case. We still do that today, obviously. But also those kinds of tombs that were placed in like the sides, the sheer sides of cliffs or in rocks. Something like the tomb of the rich man in which the Lord Jesus Christ himself was buried in, Yes. Okay, so these, these rock tombs are breaking open because of the earthquake at the moment Jesus dies. And whatever might have been like mausoleums, which would be more permanent type tomb structures, these are broken open also as Jesus dies. And then, as if that isn't enough, the centurion, the very man who's in charge of carrying out the crucifixion of Jesus, probably the, the most hardened the most battle-tested, the, 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 the most severe man in this entire scene seems to be converted in the very moment that Jesus dies because he says, truly, this was the Son of God. Now, as Matthew is telling us that, uh, we, are, we are expected to understand that all of this basically happens simultaneously to the very moment that Jesus expires, that he dies, that he breathes his last, that he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit as he dies on the cross. But notice this, that Matthew's gospel in particular and unique amongst the other gospels tells us that something else happened in that moment, and it's that something else that I want to draw your attention to. That something else takes place in verses 52 and verse 53. Notice this again, how unique this is. Only Matthew says this. Look at this. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, verse 53, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, I had to like really think about this for a second. In fact, John Cannon and I, uh, we had an interesting conversation in the narthex about the timing of all this. So Matthew seems to be pinning all of these things to the moment that Jesus dies on the cross, right? You with me so far? But this unique factor here these raising of these other bodies of the saints who are raised up and they go and they preach the gospel in in Jerusalem. This takes a little bit of thinking here because notice Matthew's trying to tie it theologically to the cross, obviously, but notice the phrase in verse 53, coming out of those tombs, those tombs that were broken open presumably because of the earthquake, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So here's what's happening here. The tombs break open at the cross the moment Jesus dies. But then it seems that at the resurrection of Christ, or shortly thereafter, that's when the bodies of the saints, they are raised up and they go into the holy city and they preach. Okay, So Matthew kind of intercalates, to use a technical term here, he takes this moment anachronistically from, probably should be in Matthew chapter 28, if it was a strict chronology here, and he places it, tying it to the moment that Jesus dies, even though he acknowledges in verse 53 that these dead bodies now raised get up after his resurrection and go into the holy city and appear to many. Now pause right there, because I'm looking at your faces and I know exactly what you're thinking, I think, I think I know what you're thinking. Here's what it is. Right now, the reasoning aspect of your brain is firing like crazy, right? And you're thinking to yourself, wait, how did that happen? Uh, Why does that happen? Do I really believe that? Like, do I actually believe that dead bodies got out of tombs and went into the city and preached and that the rational faculties of your mind right now, the synapses in your brain are firing like crazy. And maybe you're saying to yourself, maybe you're even trying to, trying to figure this out. You're saying, I wonder if Matthew, the gospel writer, because he's the only one that says this, I wonder if maybe he's getting a little bit carried away. Like maybe Matthew is so fired up about the resurrection of Christ that he adds a detail here that the other gospel writers didn't Maybe he's fabricating this little narrative out of whole cloth for some sort of elaborate theological purposes. Maybe this didn't actually happen like historically. I'm talking about literally here. Maybe Matthew 
kind of got carried away in the excitement of resurrection, the resurrection story of Christ. And so he, he just adds a flourish, just a little bit of, of a little bit of extra power to make the story come across with even more potency. And I wouldn't blame you necessarily if you were thinking that, okay? Because, and here's why I said if it's true at the beginning of the sermon, because surprisingly to me and somewhat disappointingly, I checked quite a few commentaries looking to see what other writers would have to say about this line. And I'm here to tell you this morning that I was very disappointed that even some who would be considered evangelical commentators worked their way around verses 52 and 53 to dismiss them as though Matthew is merely adding this sort of moralizing or sort of an ethical, or as one commentator said, a theologizing elaboration. So is he? Well, so just to let you know, I believe this literally, actually, and historically happened. And the reason I believe that is because I come to the text with certain presuppositions that I hope that you share with me. And I, 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 don't, I don't mind if you don't, but I just want to tell you what they are. First, um, I come to every text in the scriptures with the presupposition that this book here is the inspired, infallible, and inerrant word of God. Okay? Either this book is the authoritative revelation of the true and living God in which it tells us the story, though sometimes, yes, a little bit unbelievable, I understand. Either this book is the true revelation of the real existing living God telling us of the story about how God redeemed his people. Uh, yes, the true God comes down in this book to do things in the real course of human history such as split open a Red Sea, Okay, such as come to us in the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ. Or this book is something of like an admixture of legend and myth and so much moralizing. Now, I reject the latter and I embrace the former. So I assume that whenever I look at this book, I am in fact reading the very truly inspired word of the living God. I hope you share that presupposition with me. Okay, thank you. Not only that... Um, but, but there is a certain kind of world that I believe that we inhabit, and I hope you share that with me. I am a supernaturalist, meaning that I believe that the world in which we live does have supernatural events that transpire. Not necessarily every day, but I believe it's a world in which there is a God in the heavens who actually answers prayer. I believe this is a world in which there are real angels and demons around us, possibly in the room this morning. Fault me if you want, that's what I believe. I believe that we have the kind of God that actually hears our prayers and responds to them. And not only that, but the other presupposition that I take to a Bible passage, even such as this one, is that the real, true, and living God exists in and even beyond the realm in which we live in today. So that this God has the power to create worlds with the word of his mouth, as this God can make the universe out of nothing but his own speech, that this God can actually do things like uh, cure leprosy instantly, or like cause a paralyzed man to raise from the dead, or like cause dead men to get out of tombs. I believe all that, and so that's my presupposition this morning, and I hope you share it with me. If you don't, and you don't want to hear any more, then you are dismissed. Church is over for you today. Um, you're free to go. However, if you share those presuppositions with me, then please stay on and listen to what I think about verses 52 and 53. And by the way, even if you disagree with me, you're still welcome to stay. But I want to share with you what I think is the heart of this passage this morning. And to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the four types of resurrections that we do see in the Bible. So if you're going to take notes here comes the first point. I'm going to give you four kinds of resurrections. The first kind of resurrection that we see in the scriptures are what we might call temporary resurrections. Okay? Now, some would call them resuscitations. I don't like that word. Temporary resurrections. What do I mean by that? Well, we're talking about dead bodies that actually rose from the dead. And surprisingly, there are more than just Jesus in the Bible. In fact, I'm counting at least seven of these temporary resurrections going all the way back to the Old Testament. The first three are very curious because the first three of these temporary resurrections all uniquely 
refer to only sons. That causes me to wonder why that is the case, but it is nevertheless the case. Three of these happen to only sons. So they are as follows. First, Elijah, okay, in First uh, Kings chapter 17. There's a, a resurrection there, an account relating to Elijah. There's a second one with Elisha, disambiguation, different prophet. Okay, Elijah and then Elisha, that happens in 2 Kings 4. There's another only son resurrection in the Gospels where Jesus raises the, the widow of Nain's son. That takes place in Luke chapter 7. And again, the very fact that these happen to only sons just makes me pause and wonder why that is. Very interesting, right? I'll let you muse on that. The next temporary resurrection occurs also in Luke's Gospel, chapter 8, when Jesus raises Jairus' daughter. You'll remember that story because that's the one where Jesus very poignantly takes this little girl's hand and says, Talitha kumi, uh, translation, little girl, I say to you, rise, right? John has the next one in John's Gospel, chapter 11. Famously, this is probably the one that you could easily recall, the resurrection of Lazarus in John chapter 11. Theologically, very significant temporary resurrection in John's Gospel. And then there's a couple more in the book of Acts. In um, Acts chapter 9, there is the raising of a woman named Dorcas, also called Tabitha. By the way, if your name is Dorcas, go with Tabitha. Just sounds a little better, okay? And then the seventh one of these temporary resurrections is my favorite one. This is Eutychus in the book of Acts chapter 20. This is the guy who dies because the sermon is so long that he falls out the window, okay? If you think the sermon is going to go long, don't worry. You'll be fine. Uh, So Eutychus falls out of the window. Paul's sermon is so long, he preaches into the night, and then he's raised from the dead. Now, The reason why I don't like the word resuscitation, because that seems to suggest that they weren't really dead, okay? A resuscitation is like when somebody gets shocked with an electric shock, and the paramedics come, and they they do CPR, and their heart gets going again. That's a resuscitation. Fine. Or sometimes you hear about these stories where a person falls into a very cold lake, and their, uh, their heart slows down, and then later on they're warmed up, and they sort of revive. These are not what we're talking about here. The temporary resurrections, and I just gave you seven examples of them, are those in which the person is dead, dead like a doornail, really dead, and yet the scriptures tell us that they were raised to life again. That is what I believe is happening in Matthew chapter 27, verses 52 and 53. Okay? Now, why are they temporary? Well, because they die again. These people raised up, though, die later again. And that brings me to the second kind of resurrection. Now, this is the obvious one. It's Easter morning, right? Resurrection morning. The second classification of resurrection that happens in your Bible is the greater resurrection, the greatest resurrection. This is the resurrection to which the other other resurrections point, the resurrection of Christ. Now, on one hand, if we were to draw a Venn diagram, Jesus' resurrection is kind of like the temporary resurrections and yet also very different. How so? Well, it's like the temporary resurrections in that Jesus was actually really dead. Okay? This is not a figure of speech. We're not, we're, not, we're not talking about a resuscitation here. We're not talking about the swooning of Jesus as though he was really, really injured and then somehow recovered. We're talking about he was actually, literally, historically dead. Believe it or not, dead. Okay? So in that way, it's like it. But it's also different qualitatively different. How so? Because Jesus doesn't die again like Eutychus died again, like Tabitha died again, like the the son of the widow of Nain died again. When Jesus is raised from the dead, death itself, understand, has no power over him anymore. And not only that, but the resurrection of Jesus seems to be the pinnacle of and the summit of all of the story of redemption history in a way that the temporary resurrections were not. Now, just consider this. This is very interesting. Okay, so as the gospel writers are telling the story of the resurrection of Jesus, it becomes very obvious that this is the main point of the gospels. Yes? It's the main point of the New Testament. It's the main point of the whole of redemption history. And interestingly, as the other seven or so resurrections are told, they're almost kind of matter of fact. They're, it's not even the main point of the narratives. Like, just for example, going back to the, the one of Elisha in 2 Kings. 
That's not even the main point of the book of 2 Kings. It just happens. The main point of the book of 2 Kings is that Israel uh, basically apostatizes and God judges them with the exile. But that resurrection is not even the main point. But for Christ, it's clearly the main point, such that we might even say that the rest of the New Testament is commentary of and application to the resurrection of Jesus. Moreover, the resurrection of Jesus is clearly unique in that this is a resurrection that you and I, as Christian believers, actually participate in. That's why it's called the first fruits of the dead. Okay, so that's the second kind of resurrection in the Bible. Now there's a third kind of resurrection. There are four. This is the third one. Go back to our main text in Matthew's Gospel. Go back to the main text in Matthew chapter 27. And you're going to see one here, which again is stunning and quite surprising in fact. It happens to the centurion. You might not have noticed because it doesn't use the word resurrection or raised from the dead. But this is a resurrection here because it says when the centurion and those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly this was the Son of God. A conversion is just as supernaturally miraculous as a person being raised out of the dead. Okay? When God takes a dead, cold, unbelieving atheistic heart and floods it with new life by the power of the Holy Spirit such that that, con- that person doesn't just make a decision but their heart is actually converted that is a kind of resurrection it's life out of the dead it's life from a state of death and that by the way is one of the main theological motifs for conversion in the New Testament let me give you a couple of examples here now just maybe write these down and you can study them later. But notice how the New Testament will often speak of conversion as resurrection. Listen carefully. Colossians 3.1 If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. See what Paul said? If you have been raised with Christ... As though, for many, it's already happened. It's your conversion. It's your regeneration. It's the new life that you have in Jesus. For some of you, that's already taken place. And if it has, Paul says, then by extension, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Okay. Here's another one. Um, Romans 8, verse 11. Listen to this. Listen for the resurrection power here described. If... The spirits of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. How in is the resurrection apparent there? By the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Again, just listen carefully to the language. He will give life to your mortal bodies, mortal means diable, killable, finite bodies, he will give life to your bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Or, here's one more. Okay, I could do more than this, but I'm just going to give you three or four here. Ephesians 2, 5 and 7, Paul says, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, we were made alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us who are in Christ Jesus. Now, going back to Matthew and the centurion story here, if you think that verses 52 and 53 are somewhat unbelievable, then I would posit to you, consider also the conversion of the centurion, equally supernatural, equally equally miraculous. In fact, If pressed, I couldn't even tell you which one is the harder miracle to perform. The conversion of a dead heart versus the raising of a dead body. Both require divine, supernatural power. Now, if we had time, and we we don't, I would also want to take you to Revelation chapter 20, where it is described as the first 
resurrection. Now, I hate to even bring it up because you've had some 70 weeks in a row of the book of, Re- of Revelation here, so I'll, I'll let that one go. Other than to say, there is a, a very unique reference to the first resurrection in Revelation 21 to 6. Very difficult passage because that's the millennial text, so highly controverted anyways. And then there is a debate about whether or not the first resurrection refers to either our soul going up to be with the the presence of God at our death in the intermediate state, or whether or not it refers actually to the conversion of the heart. Uh, But again, we don't have time to solve that particular problem here this morning, other than to simply point it out. Now, that's three of the four. There is a fourth kind of resurrection that is described in the Bible. What is the last one that I did not yet mention? Do you know? You tracking with me? The resurrection of the dead at the end of all things, right? The great one, the final day, judgment day. The Bible uh, describes a great day in which all of the dead will be raised and then judged, okay? And when it talks about the dead being raised and then judged, this time it is a universal resurrection, everybody. Not just Eutychus, not just Dorcas, not just the son of the widow of Nain. All of your ancestors, all of your progeny, all of the persons presently seated in this room here this morning, every single human being, both, uh, both the godly and the ungodly, both the faithful and the unfaithful, the Bible tells us that at the end of all things, There will be a general resurrection of the dead, at which point God then judges the world perfectly and assigns us our eternal habitation forever in either heaven or hell, and there is no other third category there. Daniel discusses that at the end of the book of Daniel, and that's the book that we're going to start our exposition on next week. So let me just sum up the four resurrections, then I'm going to make just a real couple quick words of application. So the temporary resurrections, at least seven of them, if you find any others, let me know. I'll add them to the list. Those are typological and harbingers pointing to the greater resurrection, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection of Christ is greater because not only is it participative for us who are in Christ, but also death has no power over him anymore. It's not temporary, it is permanent. Jesus rises from death such that he only has life, and he has ascended to the right hand of the Father. Okay? Now, conversion then is, is something of a miracle in and of itself, in as much as it takes divine power to convert the dead heart. Therefore, we have hope as believers when it comes to the point that the final resurrection day comes because therein will follow our salvation. See how all four of those kinds of resurrections work together? With me on that? Okay, great. Now suppose, because I'm looking at your faces again, that some of you are saying to yourselves, well, that's all very interesting, but I'm a rational thinker. And I'm not sure that I'm convinced that there is any such thing as miraculous endeavors or a supernatural world. Um, Suppose you're saying to yourself, you know, as interesting as all these things are, I simply can't believe that any of this is true, much less the story of many other saints rising out of the tombs and going forth into the city of Jerusalem and preaching the gospel to the inhabitants thereof. I can't believe it. Okay. Okay. All right, because maybe you're saying to yourself, well, you know, the world is kind of strange and and weird things do happen. Maybe the ancient writers here were simply trying to find categories for those things that are simply unexplainable. Maybe then the best category for you would be to place yourself in something like an agnosticism. Agnosticism is different from atheism because agnosticism says, I don't know, and nobody really does. Okay, fine, we can still be friends. I just want to bring up one thing. There is something in these texts that you cannot possibly ignore. There is a reality described in all of these texts that I've just given you that even the most rational thinker cannot possibly evade. What is it? 
It's death itself, you see. And as unpleasant as it, as it is to think about on this day or any other day, no matter how rational you are, no matter how logical you think yourself to be, there is no way that you can avoid with all of your reason the very concrete reality of your own death. Have you thought about that? I mean, let's just do the uncomfortable just for a couple of minutes. I know it's Easter, but let's just think about that just for a minute. There will be a day when death becomes you, all right? Um, And no matter how unpleasant that thought is, it's coming. In fact, if I told you next year, let's all of us here in the room together this morning, let's all agree to meet one year from today and come together again next, next Easter. I don't even think that would be possible. You know why? Because probably somebody in this very room is going to be dead by next year. That's real. So just picture it just for a second. You're in the grave, right? And they put your best clothes on you, which is what they do when they bury a dead body. They put their best outfit on them. You're wearing your best outfit today. You ever thought about the day? You ever thought about the fact that one day you're going to be wearing the clothes that they bury you in? Well, that's kind of a weird thought. And here comes the first shovel of dirt over top of you. Very uncomfortable to think about. Very unpleasant. So, so what happens to the soul that's living right now inside of your chest? What happens to that soul? Well, there's heaven. There's hell. I guess the theoretical possibility that nothing happens. All right, really uncomfortable. Let me tell you a story, and we'll just break out of this weird moment that we're in. Um, There's a pretty good debate, interestingly, that happened not so terribly long ago um, between two philosophers, and this will be the final final, uh, flourish here. Jordan Peterson, have you heard of Jordan Peterson before? A very important critical thinker today. I agree with him a lot of the things that he says, not everything. Uh, But he's debating uh, a person from a a more leftward persuasion, Sam Harris. Sam Harris is one of the new new atheists. And Jordan Peterson, I don't know if he's a Christian or not, but he he leans right and Sam Harris kind of leans left. And and Harris puts it to him in this one moment. And he asks him probably the most important question that can be asked. Harris says, well, to Peterson, well, what about the resurrection of Jesus? Do you believe it literally happened? And Peterson, he's caught on his back foot for just a moment, and he stumbles a little bit uncharacteristically because he's very, very erudite. And and he says, he says, it would take me 40 hours to answer that question. It probably would. And and I'm not talking about like 40 hours to extrapolate the meaning of that question. I think he was actually kind of evading the moment where he doesn't really want to be pressed on whether or not he believes that Jesus actually rose from the dead. And so Harris pins him again. He rephrases the question. He asks it again. Do you believe that Jesus literally rose from the dead? And Peterson says, well, I live as though it's true. Now, some people thought that was pretty profound. I thought, that that was only another evasion of answering the question. And that the answer that he gave, as much as I like Peterson and other categories, missed the point. Either Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, or he is not. Either this book is true, or it is some kind of admixture of legend and myth. It cannot be both ways on this question. I just want to leave you with this. The reason that I believe in the resurrection is because this story is too good not to be true. There are things that are true and are good. And sometimes you hear about something that's too good to be true. But this story, the resurrection of Christ, is too good not to be true. This is the story of the defeat of death. Death can't possibly win, can it? It's only through the resurrection of Jesus Christ that death and sin and shame and guilt is finally put away. And if you believe that, I mean really believe it in your heart, then you have all of the promises of the gospel. And that 
my friends, is the good news for us on this Easter morning.